Western civilization in 1914 was an optimistic place. The last 100 years had been the era of the greatest technological and economic growth in history. All of the arts were flourishing, as was philosophy. Everywhere, European governments were liberalizing and becoming more democratic while their subjects became richer. Western civilization dominated the whole world while the rest of the world was trying to follow the West's lead. Western civilization in 1920 was broken. The bloodiest war ever fought outside of China had just ended. An entire generation of young men died in muddy fields. The supposedly civilized Western nations had committed atrocity after atrocity, acting with complete barbarism. Tradition, honor, religion, and common decency were called upon time and time again to lead millions of charging men to their deaths to move a trench line often less than a mile. The world economy was a shambles, with the Americans having the only functioning economy. Russia had collapsed into godless Bolshevism and empires like the Habsburgs, Ottomans, and Prussians that in many cases had survived since the Middle Ages were gone. The 20th century that followed was one marked by Europe's decline in power, which had been the main fact of history for the previous 400 years. The traditional ways of life collapsed, to be replaced by fascism, communism, and secularism. This demands the question, what if World War I never occurred? How would it affect borders, culture, demographics, wars, and politics? That's the question of this alternate history. Before we start, this video is a collaboration with Vologda Mapping. He made most of the maps in this video, and you can tell which ones because his maps are gorgeous. He makes history, alternate history, and fictional map videos. Check out his channel at the link in the description. Also, this video is sponsored by fantasy writer Josh Dunn. He's just released the second book in his I Overlord series, and I've just gotta say, from personal experience, his books are so much fun. The Overlord series is about a tech nerd, history buff loser getting sucked into a fantasy dimension where he's suddenly the master of a giant tower with magical abilities. His Labrador dog can also talk as well and make witty comments. This leads to fun adventures as he has to deal with the bizarre fantasy world around him. Another one of Josh's books I like a lot is Rise of the Unted, a novella where a loser gets sucked into a fantasy world where he's the zombie slave of a necromancer. He must break free of the necromancer's mind slavery, and he gradually gathers a massive zombie horde and takes over his area. You can't miss the sequel coming out soon, Necro Nancy. Josh writes really fun, fast-paced adventure stories with cool medieval fantasy world building. It reminded me of Terry Pratchett in the Netflix series Disenchanted. His writing never gets slow when there's always a new surprise. Start reading today by clicking the link in the description. The causes of the Great War are so deep and complicated that a 600-page book really couldn't give them justice. To summarize, this is a text wall. The real answer to the question isn't why did World War I break out, but what took it so long? The previous 99 years had been the greatest period of peace in European history since the Pax Romana. The tensions between the great powers have been ratcheting up for the last few decades. War nearly broke out several times over Morocco, Sudan, and Heligoland, among others, in the decades before World War I. The truth is that the international system had so much tension built into it that something would have stood in the war even if Gavrilo Princip hadn't shot the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Europe was a powder keg with lots of matches lying around. To prevent this powder keg from exploding, we need to go back a few decades and change a variable so that the keg is never there in the first place. A big reason for the long peace of the 19th century was due to Bismarck, Germany's minister from 1862 to 1890, a man who by all accounts was one of the greatest diplomatic geniuses to have ever lived. He maintained a doctrine of diplomatic flexibility. His plan was to keep Germany from having as many enemies as possible. His idea was to have Germany be on the side of three of the five great European powers. Under these circumstances, the balance of power remained stable, and so no one was incentivized to start a war since they'd lose. However, Kaiser Wilhelm II entered the picture. He was an arrogant buffoon by any metric, and he broke the Bismarckian system that had kept Europe at peace. He firstly fired Bismarck, followed by breaking off the alliance with Russia to double down an alliance with Austro-Hungary. This resulted in Russia and France forming an alliance against Germany. Secondly, he started to build a navy, which terrified Britain, the dominant naval power, who went from being a neutral balancer of the European system to Germany's enemy. 
Thus, Kaiser Wilhelm created an antagonistic balance of power that stood against Germany. Germany went from being a supporter of the European balance of power to trying to become its hegemon. The alliances became rigid and inflexible, and from there it wasn't far to war. In this timeline, Kaiser Wilhelm is less obtuse and keeps Bismarck in power for a few years more, but more importantly, takes a more Bismarckian view across the rest of his life. He tries to grow Germany quietly without threatening the other great powers, rather than the view he took in our timeline that Germany should gloriously defeat its neighbors and form a world empire. World War I resulted in a seismic shift in how every aspect of the world worked, and so I'm not going to start this timeline chronologically. Instead, I'm going to divide it by field, whether political, social, or cultural. Europe was still in relative decline before World War I. Non-Western European powers, whether Russia, the United States, or Japan, were still rising in power, and this process would continue without the war. The prime rising power was Russia, who was going through a remarkable degree of economic and demographic growth. This terrified Britain, who worried Russia would crush them in Asia. In fact, a big reason World War I happened at all was because the Germans projected that they'd be unable to defeat Russia after 1916, so they wanted to start the war before then. In this timeline, Russia would continue the spectacular growth, resulting in an alliance of Germany, Japan, and Britain against Russia. However, I don't think this war would come in the near future. Russia's immense population growth was resulting in Malthusian pressures as the peasantry in European Russia were pressed into smaller and smaller fields. This was a process that in our timeline resulted in the Russian Revolution. However, the communists only seized power by being in the exact place at the exact right time, conditions that would not exist in this timeline. We would still see some sort of revolution in Russia, however. Rather than the communists, it would likely be democratic in nature, like the rebellion in 1905 and the February Revolution in our timeline. Once in power, by giving the votes to the peasantry, you could see Russia go into a hyper-conservative, Slavic, nationalist direction, which was one of the main currents in Russia at the time. Similarly, it wouldn't surprise me if the army ended up taking over either, or the nobles were butchered French Revolution style. The communists really slowed down Russia's path to prosperity. Stalinist Russia had lower standards of living, shorter life expectancies, lower birth rates, less food, worked longer hours, and had every worse metric of well-being in every manner except literacy and urban amenities than their czarist counterparts. Russia's economy underperforming makes a good deal of sense as they literally killed the most productive peasantry or kulaks. Communism is one of the very few economic systems to retard societal growth this badly. If Russia was democratic or a right-wing autocracy, it would continue the impressive growth scene under the czars. Russia includes the world's most fertile soil and is minerally one of the richest nations, and so the potential is there. Russia today would be the world's second biggest economy, and it would have a population somewhere in the range of 400 million. Russians would migrate east into Siberia, becoming the majority in much of Central Asia and turning Siberia into a second Russian heartland. The second main political challenger to the European world order was the United States. The U.S. was a very bellicose and imperialistic nation in this era. However, this was mostly based on the New World. In our timeline, as Britain became scared of first the Russians and then the Germans, they befriended the French, Japanese, and Americans. The First World War then resulted in the U.S. directing its energies towards Europe. However, before this rapprochement between the U.S. and Britain, the two did not have super cordial relations and nearly went to war several times, with the only large, uncolonized part of the world left being Latin America. This happens in our timeline with the Germans trying to colonize Venezuela. The U.S. would deal with the spreading of European influence by doubling down in their influence in Latin America, becoming an overweening hegemon. Again, these areas were British economic dependencies, thus increasing the chances of a British-American war. Due to its much larger size and geographic proximity, this war would result in the U.S. seizing Canada and the British Caribbean, turning Latin America into an American dependency. The third main challenger to the European system was Japan. Without Russia or America's population, they wouldn't be able to challenge the European colonial powers in the same way. Instead, they'd form an alliance with Russia in order to break the European world system. This would be a major war, probably in the same timescale as our World War II, as the Russians would press into Asia and Europe while the Japanese would attack European positions in the Far East. Britain and Germany would unify against this threat. If France sides with Russia, as they likely would, we basically guess get a weird World War I here. I don't know who would win.
A major side effect of the First World War was the breakdown of the Ottoman Empire. Unpopular opinion here, but if the Ottoman Empire made it past World War I, it was in really good shape. This was since they were reforming an hour timeline before the war, a process that was finished in our timeline by Ataturk very effectively, and also they just discovered an incredible amount of oil in the Middle East that would have given them never-ending funds. The Turks would also almost certainly part of the anti-Russian coalition, thus giving them the support of the Western powers. Europe on the brink of World War I was in the throes of massive social shifts. This was since Europe had just gone through massive population growth and was seething with a restless young population. Similarly, people had just left thousands of years of traditional village life to live in crowded cities. In Eastern Europe, this was compounded by a Malthusian crisis as agricultural population density hit a critical point. In Western Europe, meanwhile, these issues were mitigated by a growth in wealth and decline in income inequality. World War I was the worst thing to ever happen to socialism and the best thing to happen to communism. Let me explain. Socialism in Western European countries was growing at a rapid pace, becoming one of the dominant political ideologies. Socialism fit very well with the optimistic, globalized, pre-World War I worldview. However, every single democratic socialist party voted to go to war, effectively betraying the Marxist notion of the international working classes against the bourgeoisie. This caused a split between social democrats like modern Sweden and communists like the Soviet Union. Thus, the world wars had the effect of weakening the coalition that was winning elections in western countries, while also creating a societal collapse that allowed the communists to seize power in Russia. If World War I never happened, social democrats would get more power inside Europe, instituting greater and greater welfare programs. They would mutate from actual Marxism as they'd have to reach consensus in a democratic society, and they'd realize the Marxist ideals would be unrealistic. We would likely see Marxist rebellions in the cities of Western Europe. This would end up similarly to the rebellions in 1848, with the military middle classes and countryside, the variables that really matter for winning civil wars, being decisively conservative, resulting in the rebellions being crushed. The elite, however, would try to prevent another rebellion by giving concessions to labor movements. Nationalism was also crippling empires like Austro-Hungary. In our timeline, the Austrian government was actually trying to create a more federal union that would give autonomy to the different ethnic groups. Since Austro-Hungary was pushed against a wall in many ways, this would happen. This would be vehemently opposed by the Hungarian section of the empire, who would lose a great deal by having the ethnic groups under their purview gaining independence. Austro-Hungary would collapse into a civil war, with the Germans supporting the German half of the empire, leading them to victory. Austro-Hungary would thus gradually become a German puppet. The massive economic growth and globalization that occurred before the First World War was great for South America. Argentina became one of the wealthiest nations in the world by shipping agricultural supplies to Western European cities. The depression that followed World War I resulted in Argentina's economy collapsing, which involved the rise of their own second-rate version of Mussolini, Perón, who kept Argentina poor for a few decades more. With a few more decades of wealth, Argentina would be significantly wealthier later on. It's hard to say whether they just blow it later. The Argentines have blown so many opportunities in our timeline that it seems more than likely. It's hard to overestimate the cultural importance of World War I. It resulted in a complete reworking of Western civilization, on the same level as the Black Death or the Fall of Rome. It destroyed traditional value systems and Western culture on every level. Look at art, for example, which went from this to this. The biggest cultural effect of World War I is that it resulted in the West losing faith in itself. Before World War I, the West believed it was the natural apex of civilization, and that it was their duty to colonize the rest of the world and impose their civilization. After the World Wars, the West had committed so many barbarisms that they lost faith in their own superiority over other societies, which destroyed the justification for colonialism. The World Wars killed colonialism in general. The Europeans became so weary fighting each other that they didn't have the resources to maintain their colonies. If the World Wars never took place, colonialism would still be in full swing. The colonies required very few men to maintain, and if the men who hadn't died in the Somme or Verdun were still around, they could die maintaining control over Calcutta or Dakar. The World Wars effectively debunked racism. This was since, before the World Wars, racism was an entirely reasonable way to view the world, given that a country's level of development was pretty closely correlated with how much Germanic blood they had. 
However, having the Slavs and Japanese fight so well in the world wars, as well as the supposed master race committing such horrible acts debunked racism. Racism would be live and well in this world. Another variable is that the West would be far more religious. World War I killed pre-existing European religion by destroying the previous belief that God was progress and hiddenly controlling the world. The intelligentsia went from being right-leaning deists to Marxist atheists. The West would maintain its traditional value systems. This would have had some positive effects such as lower crime rates, which went up with the decline in religion. There'd also be higher birth rates that correlate heavily with religion. Also, there'd be more social cohesion. However, for homosexuals and non-whites, it wouldn't be a great deal. Without women being brought into the workforce due to the world wars, we're probably putting feminism back a century. Similarly, fascism and communism would be weaker ideologies as a total, because both filled an ideological vacuum created by the decline in traditional religions. If Europe had a higher birth rate, they'd continue to export population to the colonies. This would likely result in turning South Africa into a majority white country. This was actually closer to happening than most people think, with South Africa being majority white in the 1930s. Similarly, there would be a greater white settlement in Algeria, Libya, and Kenya. In total, this is a strange world. It's a far more stable one than ours, and that always disturbs me. It's a world that generally continues the trajectories of the 19th century, while the history of the world has generally been the history of drastic changes. However, I'm continually wrong several times a day, and the truth is always stranger than fiction. They would certainly find our world horrifying, insane, and crass. To each his own, I guess. Well, if you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check out Vologda Mapping's channel. Besides that, you can support me on Patreon, where I've got the first 10 chapters of my history of the world, as well as all sorts of really cool maps. Or alternatively, follow me on Twitter. As always, thanks so much for watching, and have a great day.